everyone. We're going to get started here. Thank you all for being here with us in Sioux Falls and um, those who are, who are joining us now for this luncheon, welcome. I'm Rebecca Cruz. I'm the Deputy Director at the South Dakota Arts Council. And as the state agency, we have the pleasure of carrying out the Poetry Out Loud program in South Dakota. Poetry Out Loud it was founded and funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation. And it's a program that starts in the classroom um, with teachers doing poetry units with their high school students. And then students, it helps students master public speaking skills and build self-confidence and learn about literary history and contemporary life through memorization and recitation of great poetry. So the program culminates in a statewide recitation competition, and we are privileged today to have our state champion from the 2018 competition with us. He's going to kick off our luncheon event. Gage Gramlick is a junior at Lincoln High School here in Sioux Falls, and just two weeks ago, we traveled with him and his teacher, Amanda Nelson, to Washington, D.C., where he represented South Dakota at the Poetry Out Loud National Finals, and he took top honors among the entire nation in the spoken word original poetry component. Um, Amanda Nelson is clearly a very inspiring mentor and coach and teacher, so I just want to take a moment to recognize her. Um, she's not here with us today, but we, we thank Amanda vastly for, for her um, great leadership in South Dakota and the arts education community. So now Gage will take the stage and present his original national award-winning poem, Moonstruck. Tinnitus is a constant buzzing that no one else can hear. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and all I see is the sound that doesn't exist, a lunar clamor. The deeper I stare into the darkness, the brighter the sound. A Hoover vacuum on the TV grandma left on because she sleeps better with noise, I guess. It's like when your pet goldfish or grandpa dies in the second grade and the longer you stare at the body in the toilet or coffin, the deader it gets. Dead as in fake, not real, fabricated, petroleum-based skin and scales. I tell the woman I'm stuck in a dream, but they hear that I'm weaving dreams of grandeur out of wisps of nebulous nothings get back on the ground, but this isn't a fantasy. It's an upside-down nightmare where the monsters under my bed or closet are my best friends because they are really real. Really, the thing is, I'd rather be dead than never feel again. I'm floating. Okay, sinking, but I'm okay. Her voice looks like a rusty chain link fence on the side of a highway after a rainstorm caused by global warming or just a normal storm I can never tell anymore. She asks me if I know what the word cognitive means, then she squeaks. I know what the word cognitive means. It means that you think that my fake feelings that really don't feel fake are fake. I'm your project. I'm not projecting. You're too detached. Too many people can't fathom the depth of the sound I see, including my parents, which is why I guess they brought me to you to shake out the fake fakeness. But you ideate hate because I am a stargazer struck by the moon and moonstruck men are broken. You claim that your stellar bandages can mend, and I guess I'll pretend too, because seeing them in pain is like fish or funerals. I hate it. I didn't kill my pet goldfish, but I was glad when it died. I dissociate from you. Now what? I keep moving my bed from one wall to the other because it's hard keeping up relationships with walls, tiring. I don't sleep in bed, though. If I sleep, it's on the bathroom floor. Sure, it's weird, but the sound of the fan is exactly the sound of the one I see, so it's almost like I'm blind or what I'm seeing is really real, which is painfully reassuring. I sleep on the cold, white laminate lights on. <laughs> I'm floating in time. In moments like these, my life is concurrent. And I love getting swept up by the undertow. Moon-powered waves carry me like lukewarm pallbearers to my future. I see the kids I don't want, but will have, because everything fades and 
I don't want to. And there is a buzz, an undeniable buzz. But I don't mind it anymore because he can hear it too. That was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Hello, my name is Patrick Baker, and I'm the director of the South Dakota Arts Council. Before I introduce our next performer, I just want to take a moment to recognize Charlotte Carver, the very first director of the South Dakota Arts Council. Without you, Charlotte, we wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> And in this unique set of circumstances, I'd also like to quickly recognize my predecessor, Michael Pangburn, a mentor to me. Thank you, Michael, for all that you've taught me. I now have the honor and privilege to introduce to you Brian Akipa. Brian is a member of the Siston Wapton Oyate. He is a visual and performing artist. He is a Dakota flute maker and player a 2016 NEA National Heritage Fellow, and very recently was awarded the Native Arts and Culture Foundation Mentorship. Brian is, I've had the pleasure of hearing Brian play a few times now, including at the 2017 Governor's Awards in the Arts, and Pierre, thank you for performing then. But I always go back to the first time I heard him play, and it was at Jane and John Rasmussen's uh, lake home just outside of Sisseton. And there was a gathering of arts leaders and artists. And uh, after dinner, Brian played. And immediately, there was a hush, of course, throughout the room. And I remember closing my eyes and listening and just being overcome with a peace and tranquility that I hadn't felt in so long. And so I want to thank you for that, Brian. And it is now, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to the stage Brian Akipa. First, I'd like to um, <clears throat> thank the National Endowment of Data Arts. Um, that experience was so awesome that it kind of sparked a new interest. Uh, I'd almost thought my flute playing was going away, but then this new energy came. And it brought a new idea. It inspired me to think about um, this traditional flute and how to better bring it to the classroom. And <clears throat> a lot of people have done a lot of things with the flute. There's new age flutes and people try to westernize it and do social events and flute circles. But I've only studied traditional flute and traditional music. And with this is a lot of history culture and philosophy, and I feel these need to be preserved. So I had this idea to try to uh, do that and try to figure out a way to, to do that. And studying under Oscar Howe at the University of South Dakota painting, I watched him do something similar to that. He took Tohokmu, an ancient philosophy of the first use of design and color. And he took that and brought it into contemporary native art and into the classroom. So I know it can be done, and I just had to figure out how to do that. Then I have to thank Arts Alive South Dakota, the South Dakota Symphony, the Assistant Arts Council and Jane Rasmussen, and the Lakota Music project, Barry LeBeau, because they were able to bring in a professional composer, Jared Tate, a Comanche from Oklahoma, to Siston, 
and they had a music composing workshop. And then right away I said, oh, good. I said, I'm really, I want to really try this. And they said, this is for Native youth. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> then they said, and old Native guys. And I said, yay, yeah, they did it. <laughs> so we started this, and my idea was I wanted to compose some music with a woodwind can quintet. And I wanted to use a metal arc song to be part of this melody. And this metal arc was important to me because growing up out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere, you could hear metal arcs all day long in the summertime. And my grandmother once said to me, she said, listen to that metal arc. She said, that metal arc can speak Dakota. And she said, this metal arc says, Paji Skuya, Awahadi. And it's saying, sweet grass is over here. And when you hear this metal arc say that, it's a special day, it's a special time. So that was always important to me and part of the oral history and culture. And so how we did that is we digitally recorded a metal arc song, slowed it down, used a tuner, a guitar tuner actually, and uh, notated each note. And since it's slowed down, you could easily pick up each, because when they sing, it's really fast. And so we were able to pick out every single note and uh, notate it. Once we did that, I also noticed it has several songs, and each with slightly a different variation also has some chirps and rattles. It can rattle its voice. So all this became part of it, and we used music software, and it became a song. And originally I wrote it for the Woodwind Quartet and so this is my very first time playing it for an audience in a solo.
Thank you, Brian. That was absolutely beautiful. I'm now going to introduce an artist, an arts advocate, an arts supporter, an arts enthusiast, not only in Sioux Falls, but across the entire state of South Dakota and beyond. Uh, she is also a colleague and a friend, and she's the chair of the South Dakota Arts Council, Lynn Byrne. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see so many South Dakota faces and some North Dakota faces and some Washington DC faces. We're delighted you're all here. This is a challenge for me. I, there's so much I could say about this wonderful woman, this artistic leader, this force. But I'm just going to give you a few highlights this morning because I want to save lots of time to give you the gift of more time with Jane this morning. Some of you may know that Jane lived in South Dakota for a short time, which I, I'm very proud of. Um, she is the daughter of Chinese immigrants. She is degreed in piano, music, music education. She's an artiste. She has an MBA, and she has a PhD in philanthropic studies. In the four years that Jane has masterfully chaired the National Endowment for the Arts, she has been to many, many countries, for the NEA. She has been, been in all 50 states, some many times. She's been in South Dakota several times. She's been in 200 communities, and she's been on 400 sites, and I'm sure there's even more than that, I'm sure. We have been blessed to have Jane here several times, as I said, and uh, she shared with us one of her most meaningful moments in the last four years happened in her tenure at the NEA happened right here in South Dakota. And I'll tell you about it in a minute. She's launched several new meaningful programs at the NEA that have shined light on the current state of the arts and on how the arts connect with other industries. And we've heard more about that yesterday and we'll hear more today. Anyway, getting back to this meaningful moment repatriation. Jane brought back to Pine Ridge recordings from the 1800s of the Ogallala Sioux language. And she, in a beautiful ceremony on Pine Ridge, presented these recordings, these precious recordings, brought them home and they have for many, many, many years been on the East Coast, and now they are back home in the Pine Ridge Tribal Library, and I think that is very cool, very cool. South Dakota. <laughs> as, South Dakota as a South Dakotan and all of you here, we are so honored that the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Chu, is with us today. Welcome, Jane. Thank you so much. It, it's wonderful to be here again. Uh, I love South Dakota. And Patrick Baker, thank you so much. Um, and your team and the South Dakota Arts Council for all you're doing, and Arts South Dakota, and the Sioux Falls Arts Council. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you today. It's so great to be here. Uh, it is my third visit to South Dakota with my NEA hat on, and it's great to be able to see once again uh, the rich and the varied cultural landscape that South Dakota offers. And you're absolutely right, that was one of the most meaningful experiences uh, during my term at the NEA, uh, and to be able to participate in the repatriation ceremony with uh, the president of the tribe and uh, just to be able to go through the formal uh, handing back of some recordings that belong to the Golala Lakota uh, people. Uh, very, very special and something I'll never forget. I'm very impressed with this arts conference because you're bringing people together who are creating an environment for the arts to be able to thrive. So artists and arts organizations and leaders, uh, government officials, policy makers, researchers, civic leaders, patrons, 
because the arts really require strong leadership at every level and talking with each other as you're doing in order to flourish. And that's what this conference recognizes. There is a reason that South Dakota is active in the arts in so many ways. There's a reason that South Dakotans don't just think that the arts are off in a corner by themselves, but instead they can connect the arts with other sectors too, other non-art sectors including. Uh, there's a reason that students in South Dakota are able to engage with working artists both within and outside the classroom. There's a reason that South Dakotans can honor and celebrate the traditions and the cultural heritage of their state. We are moving toward a vision of the arts connecting individuals of all ages and communities a vision of helping the arts and artists and the whole environment thrive. So there would be an, an environment with a variety of ways for people to be engaged with the arts. So in this kind of visionary world, one person might be interested in, say, classical music, and another might feel a resonance with, say, jazz or blues. In this kind of world, every student could adopt an art form that belonged to him or her. Why? Because schools would recognize at a very fundamental level there's a strong relationship between being involved in the arts and increased achievement, not only in the arts themselves, but also in other areas of school, so that students would have a tool belt of art skills to be able to express themselves that would go way beyond the use of just linear, everyday conversations in order to communicate with the others. This is the kind of visionary world where the arts would be an effective path to represent our identities so that we could recognize the very special characteristics and the traditions and heritage that each of us brings to the table. This is the kind of visionary world where instead of a perception that the arts are disconnected and sequestered in a corner off by themselves, people from all walks of life would recognize the relationship between the arts and how they connect with other aspects of life. Where the arts would be a standard line item in the city budget and mayors would jump in to work with urban design to address the infrastructure of their community in order to showcase its beauty and re rejuvenate the areas of town that were once blighted and previously ignored and artists would be sought after by the healthcare system because medical professionals would note that medicine combined with art would optimize a therapeutic healing greater than medicine alone. And would the arts play any role in the economic vitality of a community? Well, in this kind of visionary world, businesses, large and small, would emphasize the arts in order to attract talented workers because potential employees would be looking for a place to live that showed vibrancy, things to do, where companies wanted to relocate their headquarters and their branches based upon the good arts programs that were available for their families, and where tourists and residents would plan their outings around arts events throughout the year where the words arts and jobs are synonymous. So we're already experiencing this type of momentum that's multiplying across the nation, including right here in South Dakota. And this is in large part thanks to you here today. You've done so much to connect people from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of perspectives, and you are exposing our common humanity through the arts. So you have seen Freeman, South Dakota, connect the arts with agriculture through their plans for the Arts Earth Center. And you've seen children throughout South Dakota in school classrooms and after school programs participating in music and theater, visual arts, traditional and folk art, dance, writing, thanks to the South Dakota Arts Council's Artists in Schools and Communities program. There's so many wonderful artists of all genres in South Dakota, and this connects the work of artists to others. And you have seen how the arts honor with such meaning the traditions, the history, the heritage, and identity from Ogallala Lakota beadwork, ledger art, dances, to Norwegian wood carving and blacksmithing, 
And what about that mural created by the Meldrum Park neighborhood residents in Sioux Falls? Not only does this mural show stories of the Meldrum Park residents, it has created a more vibrant and more meaningful neighborhood in which they live. And look what you're doing to optimize the therapeutic potential of South Dakota's healthcare system. You're connecting the arts with cancer patients through your Journey of Healing program. And look how you're serving older adults through the Art for Life program. And you're bringing hope to South Dakota's veterans thanks to your new Arts and the Military Initiative with Lieutenant Governor Matt Michaels and Arts South Dakota. And I want to applaud you and your commitment to equity as you're striving to reach underserved areas, rural, remote, inner city, and tribal, so that geography will not dictate a South Dakotan's ability to participate in the arts. Because when it comes to the arts, there should be no such thing as a marginalized population. Every individual, from child to grandparent, deserves the opportunity to find their creative voice through the arts and live in a community where creativity can thrive. Look at the National Heritage Fellows from South Dakota. These are the recognized top national masters of folk and traditional arts in the United States. Leroy Graber from Freeman, Kevin Locke from Mobridge, Nellie Starboy Menard from Rosebud, Alice New Holy Blue Legs from Oglala, and Brian Akipa from Sisseton, who's here with us today. And what about Gage Gramlich? There are uh, every year, every year in our Poetry Out Loud competition, 300, about 300,000 students from all over the nation participate in this, 300,000. And then it gets uh, narrowed down to the state winners. So there's one uh, getting to narrow down to one uh, of 50 state winners out of 300,000. And then to, for Gage to be able to win the, the category of poetry ourselves out, uh, spoke, outward, spoken out loud uh, section is quite a compliment out of 300,000 students. And then there's Maddie Lakomsky, which who is right there. Maddie from Sioux Falls also, who two years ago represented the state of South Dakota in the 2016 National Poetry Out Loud competition, created her own poem, and also won the same category. Out of all of these students, two of them here from South Dakota are winning that, that category. What is going on in Lincoln High School in Sioux Falls that... Congratulations. That's a pattern you can brag on. There are 14,067 workers in the arts in South Dakota, and the arts add $1.2 billion to the South Dakota economy in one year. So that accounts for about 2.5% of the state's economy. So from an economic perspective, that is no slouch. These old and tired myths about how the arts are starving or they're dying away or they're just a fluff or a frill, they do not hold up next to the hard evidence. Sometimes we meet people who believe that it's either the National Endowment for the Arts Chair or the NEA staff who sit around making decisions on which projects get funded and which do not, but that's also another myth. In fact, it is you, the experts in the field, who are the first to make recommendations on which projects should receive NEA funding. Because every grant application that we receive at the National Endowment for the Arts is first reviewed by a panel of experts and laypersons from all over the United States in a specific discipline. And this is such a wonderful process because once the panel of experts makes its recommendations on which projects to support, the second recommendation step out of three is it takes place when the National Council also reviews the same uh, grant applications. Those are also experts from all over the United States. And then the third step is the NEA chair signs off on the final award recommendations. And we've been really fortunate to have nine South Dakota experts on our grant review panels over the past four years alone. Panel experts, and we have panel members from all over all 50 states, but in South Dakota we've had panelists just in the last four years from Fort Pierre, 
Martin, Pier, Porcupine, Rapid City, Sioux Falls, and Wakpala. And if you've ever been, by the way, if you've ever been one of the NEA panelists, let me express my heartfelt thanks to you for your expertise and your willingness to serve on one of our grant panels. So you can see together, we're shaping the arts in America. It's not just one person saying this is what art should be and what it isn't. You, we're shaping it together and we can celebrate that. So that's why I wanted to be here with you today, to be able to thank you for the work that you're doing to embrace the lives of so many South Dakotans through the arts. You're creating an environment where the arts are embraced as a fundamental an indispensable part of our daily lives, not just some people's daily lives, but all of our daily lives. So when the next Harvey Dunn from Yankton is born, or the next Sean Colvin from Vermilion is born, or the next Oscar Howe is born, or, the, or Myron Florn from Roslyn, or the next Laura Ingalls Wilder moves to DeSmet, or the next Brian Akipa from Sisseton is born, their futures are going to be bright because the surroundings that you're creating is going, they're going to be a place for creativity and they're going to cultivate their skills because of the conditions that you're creating uh, to celebrate the arts in so many different ways. So thank you for your work to make these words a reality for South Dakota and thank you for letting me join you today. Thank you, Jane. We're so honored to have you here with us. Uh, the food will be coming shortly. I just want to quickly set up a video that you're about to watch. Uh, when I came to the Arts Council a little over two years ago, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the South Dakota Arts Council. So SDAC, as, as we call ourselves, teamed up with Arts South Dakota then with the goal of trying to create a video that not only celebrated a strong 50-year history of public support for the arts, but also celebrated the amazing uh, artists and things we have happening right here and right now in South Dakota, and we think it's just as relevant today as it was then. I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. They sent a $25,000 check to state planning and said we want everybody, every state in the nation to have an arts agency. And so that's how it started. My sister worked for the University at Vermilion. She saw this article in the paper in the Argus and said they're looking for a director of an arts council. Charlotte, that is the perfect job for you. Apply. It was in my husband's store. He had had a millinery shop up in the front of his store. And I said, well, that's just enough space for me for a typewriter and a desk and a file. That's all I need. So anyway, that's how it started. I wanted to recognize artists. I wanted to have South Dakota have artists like Jackson Pollock in Wyoming. You know, somebody that was famous in the arts in South Dakota. I think my goals as an artist has been to start small and to kind of work my way up worldwide. And it's always nice to be able to come home to the heart of where I grew up to be able to share that. I would say at least, you know, area that I'm most familiar with here in, in western South Dakota, there's a real strong group of artists that have been around for a long time. I moved to South Dakota in 96, and I think it was 98 that I started working as a visiting artist. I started doing residencies as soon as I was out of college, and it was just a few a year in the beginning, and it's grown into something that's like a regular part of what I, of what I do in my cycle throughout the year. Being an artist in South Dakota is important. And whether you stay here or you leave, doesn't matter. But if somehow you've learned something from being an artist physically here, it's the frontier. It's like one of the, the last pieces of virgin territory in the US. And there are places that you can step in that may have never been stepped on before. Me being able to join with the South Dakota Arts Council and be able to work with them is, is such a great step for me to take. I spent some years mending my own hoop, so to speak, and it gave me a, the Arts Council gave me a platform to continue the healing myself and dancing and being a role model and how to take responsibility for your own brokenness. 
I've done, I don't know, 800 weeks or maybe a little more, going into schools and communities, working with all different ages of people on many different media. It's just been a real lush, diverse experience for me and I think for the people that I've worked with too. It's hard to say no. Um, you develop relationships with people uh, and, and institutions like this. Part of the Arts Council's aim is to demonstrate value and I, I feel like through programs um, such as the Artists in the Schools and Communities program and Touring Artists program, you have an opportunity to bring art into those small communities and show people how it can improve their lives. I think what the Arts Council does is it brings art to the audience, essentially. That's what we do. We help fund artists, we help facilitate their work so that more people can see it, that more people can enjoy it. You know, the last seven generations have had it really rough amongst our people. Stars representing the next seven generations. My job here, as I see it, is to build a skill set for other artists, the Susie Kappa artists, so that they can tell their story, so that their imagination finds more full expression. And I'm pretty moved by that whole idea. <laughs> more than I think sometimes, I guess. Um, yeah, it is an amazing place where amazing things happen for people that not necessarily amazing things happen for. When you pull somebody in for the first time and really affect them, give them a positive experience, you're showing them that this is adding value to your life. You, you know, that South Dakota is a place where you can get great art too. You can experience great art right here. In South Dakota, we have a gift that has been given to us and that gift is the landscape itself and it, I think it nourishes and it fuels and it's something that a lot of people don't get. And, and that's, why, that's why I'm here.